Those are truly things that we can agree to disagree with. <laughs> That's right. Oh, so Galatians chapter 2. We are finally getting back to Galatians. We, yeah. well, we just, we all took a week off the last week. Galatians 2, we'll be starting at verse 11. Thank you, Father, for your word. Lord, we just thank you for this beautiful day. Uh, beautiful in that we may even get some more rain, and that is something that is a great blessing. Uh, we, we definitely need it. We know the farmers need it. And we truly pray that those places in Australia that have been in drought would get the rain. And Lord, we ask for the rain of your Holy Spirit to, to wash upon our lives and to fill us afresh as we study your word. In Yeshua's name, amen. Right, we are going to be starting at verse 11 and reading through to the end of the chapter. As I read through this passage, this, this portion right here is really a story, a follow-on of Paul's history. It's a story that he tells of, between him and Peter that really encapsulates the entire argument in the book of, or the letter to the congregations in Galatia. And so we will find in the passage that we read today, the very, if you will, the heart of the entire letter, the, the argument that, that Shaul is trying to make to these congregations, uh, in, encapsulated in a single verse. Now, I didn't realize uh, when I started, as many times when I start reading through a passage, you read through it, you, if, you, if you're not careful, you just kind of gloss over everything, and you read through it quickly, you're like, oh, that's interesting. And then I do, I read some commentaries, I look at different perspectives. Uh, there's several Messianic uh, Jewish com commentaries, one uh, with, by David Stern, that's a companion to the Complete Jewish Bible. Uh, the commentaries, uh, it's uh, pretty concise, but it gives some good insights. And I didn't realize how important some of these verses were until I went to the third page of commentary on a single verse. And you start to realize, ah, I think the commentator is seeing a little bit more than I saw at first. Let me go back and read the passage. You go back and read it and you say, ah, oh, okay, I'm starting to see that this, this passage, these verses here, form the foundation for the rest of the argument that, that Shaul is going to make. So let's read, starting at verse 11. <coughs> but when Peter came to Antioch, I opposed him to his face, because he was clearly in the wrong. For before certain people came from Jacob, he regularly ate with the Gentiles. But when they came, he began to withdraw and separate himself, fearing those from the circumcision. And the rest of the Jews joined him in his hypocrisy, so that even Barnabas was carried away in their hypocrisy. But when I saw that they were not walking in line with the truth of the good news, I said to Peter in front of everyone, If you, being a Jew, live like the Gentiles and not like the Jews, how can you force the Gentiles to live like Jews? We are Jews by birth and not sinners from among the Gentiles. Yet we know that a person is set right, not by deeds based on Torah, but rather through putting trust in Yeshua the Messiah. So even we have put our trust in Messiah Yeshua in order that we might be set right based upon trust in Messiah, and not by deeds based upon Torah. Because no human will be justified by deeds based upon Torah. <clears throat> but if, while seeking to be justified in Messiah, we ourselves are also found to be sinners, is the Messiah then an agent of sin? May it never be. For if I rebuild the very things I tore down, I prove myself to be a lawbreaker, for through the law I died to the law, so that I might live for God. I have been crucified with Messiah, and it is no longer I who live, but Messiah lives in me. And the life I now live, I live by trusting in Ben Elohim, who loved me and gave himself up for me. I do not nullify the grace of God, for if righteousness comes through Torah, then Messiah died for no reason. 
All right. So here we have a very interesting uh, discussion, argument between Peter and Paul in a very public setting. Um, this, before we get into the discussion and the, some of the details, we have to remember when this letter was written. We talked about this a couple of weeks ago. This letter to Galatia was written after Paul's first missionary journey, which is about Acts chapter 13 and 14. So it's between Acts 14 and Acts 15. Acts 15 talks about the council in Jerusalem, where they're discussing this very issue in Jerusalem. But somewhere between Acts 13, where he met up with these congregations in southern Galatia, and the council in Jerusalem, this letter was written. The reason this is important is because Acts chapter 13 comes after Acts chapter 10. These things might, you know, I mean, you think about that and you're like, okay, yeah, that makes logical sense. But Acts chapter 10 is all about Peter meeting up with Cornelius. Do you remember that story? Remember the time when, uh, you know, Cornelius was praying and an angel visited him and, and says, go get Peter who happens to be in Joppa. He's living in uh, Peter the Tanner's house. And, or Simon the Tanner's house. Thank you, Simon. Uh, we got to visit, by the way, Simon the Tanner's house when we were in Joppa just this last last trip. But somebody else lives there. You know, that's the that's other. That's 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 you visit all these ancient sites and you realize, oh, you know, people still live there uh, in these houses. So there's a big plaque on the roof that says, Simon the Tanner's house, please don't enter. This is a private property. <laughs> so, but we got to visit that house and... Um, and you, you, there's this vision that Peter sees. He sees the, all the food, the traif, the food that would never be eaten by a Jewish person, brought down in front. And he says, rise and eat. And uh, he says, no, Lord, I've never had anything that is unclean in my mouth before. And so this happened three times. And then Peter's wondering, what on earth did that mean? And just as the vision ended, the, the, uh, the servants of Cornelius came up and said, hey, would you be willing to come and visit a Gentile? He's a God-fearer. He's a good man. He's <coughs> even built a synagogue. Uh, but would you come and visit him? So that's the story in Acts chapter 10. That's the history that Peter has prior to this meeting, this confrontation that Paul is recounting in Galatians chapter 2. Well, when you start to realize that, there's a couple of things in the conversation that Peter had with Cornelius that become important. This is the understanding that Peter had. And you can jump over there if you wish, but it's Acts chapter 10. I'll just read a couple of verses that I have printed out here. Peter tells Cornelius, he says, You yourselves know that it is not permitted for a Jewish man to associate with a non-Jew or to visit him. Yet God has shown me that I should call no one holy or unclean. Peter then goes on to say a couple of verses later, he says, I truly understand that God is not one to show favoritism, but in every nation, the one who fears him and does what is right is acceptable to him. Peter then returned to Jerusalem and expressed this entire event, had to explain it several times, to those of the circumcision. That's an interesting phrase. And that phrase is this group of people who went around saying that you must be circumcised, which means you must physically become a Jew to be accepted by Yeshua and to be accepted by God. But it says that in Acts chapter 11, it says those of the circumcision took issue with him saying, you went to an uncircumcised man and you ate with them? So here's... Yeah, here's a question that should be asked. Where in Jewish law does it say that a Jew must not eat or even go and visit with a Gentile? Well, it depends, right? The, 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 the correct, the correct uh, um, what is it, the legal answer, the answer I learned in my law class was, well, that depends, right? You can answer that, that goes for everything. Well, that depends. And it does. There is no scripture in the Torah that says that you could not eat with Gentiles. There's no scripture in the Tanakh. So we're talking about the, the whole of Hebrew scripture. 
There's no scripture that says that it's wrong for a Jewish person to eat with a Gentile. There are scriptures that define what Jews are allowed to eat and that Gentiles are allowed to eat different food. Uh, in fact, the food that as a Jew you're not allowed to eat, you're allowed to sell to the Gentiles. So there are scriptures that are, that are about that. There are allowances for those things. However, there's no scripture that says that you could not socialize and eat with the Jewish, a Jewish person with a Gentile. However, in the Talmud, there are a lot of places that talk about how eating with a Gentile could make you ritually unclean. So when I'm talking of the Talmud, I'm talking of the, the Jewish commentaries, the, the rabbis over the ages who have who've compiled uh, the, 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 the Talmud, the Gematria, the different, the different writings, what is now known as the Oral Law. Uh, it's now written down, so it's no longer oral, but that being said, there are a lot of passages that specifically talk about not socializing with Gentiles. This is not the com consistent message for the whole of Talmud. Uh, I know that in, in years past, the, those small verses that talk about not, Jews not socializing with Gentiles have kind of been blown out of proportion and, and been used to bring great persecution against the Jewish people. Um, and, um, you know, to the shame of the, the Christians at that time, they went along with it. Unfortunately, it is not, well, fortunately, or just in reality, it's not the consistent message of the Talmud. However, there's enough in there to understand where Peter got this idea. And, yes? Sorry, did it also have to do with the El Taor, where they ate with Indians, and that that had to do with sacrifices? So, so the question is, would it, is there a part in the, the story of Baal Peor? So this is when the Moabite uh, were basically, they had brought, um, if you remember, Balaam and his donkey to, to curse the children of Israel and went to King Balak. And Balak says, you know, I'm paying you, go curse these people. He goes up the mountain and God says, you're only going to say what I'm telling you to say. So he blesses them instead of cursing them. And this happens three different times. And <coughs> in the process, uh, you know, the Lord just blessed the children of Israel out of Balaam's mouth, out of a pagan prophet. He's not a god. He was not a godly man. Don't think that he was a godly man. Later on, though, he couldn't help himself because, you know, he was promised this room full of gold and silver. And he wanted that room full of gold and silver. And he wasn't getting it by prophesying. So he stuck around in with, and stayed with the Moabites and ended up being killed by Joshua or was it Joshua and Moses and the armies, a little bit later. The reason is, is the very next passage is this sin that the children of Israel committed with Baal Peor. And um, what Eli's talk, uh, mentioning is they, they, they realized they couldn't get God to curse the children of Israel. So what Balaam actually did, and we actually find this out from the book of Jude, is he convinced Balak, you can't get God to curse them, but you can make God, their God, angry at them by getting them to follow your gods. That's exactly what the Moabites did in that passage. So the question is, does it refer back to uh, eating and drinking with the Moabites? There's still no commandments there that say you shall not eat with them. There's definite commandments that says you shall not intermarry with the Moabites after that point, that they shall, you know pushing them aside, which was not God's original intent. But that being said, there's still no commandments. There might be some commentaries on that, again, in the oral law, that would say, no, don't even eat with them, don't even socialize, because you could become ritually unclean. And that is actually the backdrop, though. The backdrop is this, there's this understanding, the cultural understanding that Peter had, that if I go and visit into a, into a Gentile's home, I will become ritually unclean. And that's not as big a deal today because there's not a standing temple. But ritual cleanliness, and you'll see this unclean versus clean, meant that the men were either allowed or not allowed to go into the temple to worship. And they were still visiting the temple, as we know from Acts chapter 4. Peter and John went up to the temple to pray, and they met a man on the way. You know, that, that song and passage. Yeah, so um, that's the backdrop, though. Peter saw this... He didn't want to go into a Gentile's house. And it was only because he received that vision from the Lord, God saying to him, don't call what I've called clean. 
unclean. And Peter says, now I understand that the vision is not about animals, it's about people. It's about people. So here we have, in that case, we had the same, the group of the circumcision who were again coming in saying, you must become Jewish to be accepted by the Lord, to be under the Mosaic covenant. And what the new covenant was saying is, no, you don't. Under the new covenant, that was no longer a requirement to become Jewish, to be accepted by Adonai. And so what had happened is Peter, because of this revelation, was now eating and drinking and fellowshipping with Gentile believers, uh, as we see here. And then he was, he was socializing with them, eating with them. It doesn't say that he was eating unkosher food. It's not about the food. It's about actually even eating with somebody across the table uh, and just sitting down and talking with them in that sort of environment. That's an, in, that's an intimate place when you're fellowshipping with someone over a meal. And then when you had people come up from Jacob, it says. So Jacob is the brother of Yeshua, otherwise known as James. Uh, uh, and that's, a, that's King James's only thing. The translators of, of King James Version actually did a very good job. For those of you, I mean, I know that it's not as understood in today's English terms, but they did a very good job of the translation of King James. But they thought that they would uh, satisfy the patron, the guy who paid them, which was King James himself, and change the name Jacob to James, which actually is pretty close <coughs> sort of, except for the fact that we still have Jacob in English. But other than that, the translation is actually really good. So James, though, is the leader of the congregation in Jerusalem, not Peter. That's a whole other discussion for another time. But these men of the circumcision came up saying that they were sent from Jacob. We actually find out in Acts chapter 15 that while they had come from Jerusalem, Jacob disowns them and says... They left from us, but we didn't empower them to speak on our behalf. They are not speaking on our behalf. And if you look at the letter that they get Paul and Barnabas to carry with them in Acts chapter 15 and 16, you'll see that, that they did not support these people of the circumcision. But when the people of the circumcision came up, Peter stopped eating with the Gentiles. So he was eating with them and fellowshipping, and then all of a sudden they came up, and for either appearances sake or for a lapse of conscience, as Peter has been known to do in the past, uh, a place of weak willedness, whatever you want to call it, he withdrew <coughs> from eating with Gentiles. When you withdraw from somebody, when you disassociate when you were associating with them and now you're disassociating, the people you disassociate from, they say, what, what, did, what went wrong? What did I do? And they will look for something to do to restore that relationship. And it says that because of Peter's status, because he was an apostle, that all the other Messianic Jews followed him, including Barnabas. This is why Paul confronts him publicly. He saw that what the hypocrisy of Peter being so visible and causing other people to stumble, he realized that this was going to put a huge wedge between Jews and Gentile believers. And he says, this has to stop. This is not in accordance with the good news. And so publicly, he approached him. Now, I don't recommend this. This is not the recommended approach of how to confront somebody when they're in sin. However, when you have a public figure in public sin, and you see the public going along with that public sin, something does have to be done to address them. So before I go into the good reasons that Paul had to confront him this way, I did want to take just a, a short detour and talk about the proper way to confront people. Just, in, just to give that balance. So this is from Matthew chapter 18. Let's go ahead and turn to Matthew chapter 18, starting at verse 15. Now, we actually talked about this 
Uh, well, Andre and I didn't talk about it, but Andre's already spoken about this this morning. And I love how the Holy Spirit will often uh, follow a theme. And I want you to really listen to this passage. We'll start in verse 15. So Matthew chapter 18, starting in verse 15. It says this. Now, if your brother sins against you, go to him, show him his fault while you're with him alone. If he listens to you, then you have won your brother. But if he does not listen, then take with you one or two more, so that by the mouth of two or three witnesses every word might stand. But if he refuses to listen to them, tell it to Messiah's community. And if he refuses to listen to Messiah's community, let him be to you as a pagan and as a tax collector. There's a three to four step process, if you will, depending on where, where you divide the steps. And the first is to, if a brother sins against you, you go to them and talk to them privately. This is an interesting point because a lot of times in this sort of community, we are not out to hurt each other. We are not this, you know, the Lord has done a work in our hearts already where it is no longer enjoyable to inflict pain upon each other. At least I sure hope so. And if you're struggling with that, please come to me. We've got deliverance. We believe in deliverance and salvation and the Lord gives you a new heart. All right. So that goes for those listening online as well. If that is it, if you find hurting others enjoyable, you need to repent. Okay? That's obviously a sin. But in this community, we're talking about a brother. A brother, a fellow believer, a brother and sister in Messiah. If they sin against you, you will feel the pain of it. They may not. They may not even realize they stepped on your toes and didn't even know and they kept driving. Or they kept going. You know, they just didn't realize it. The Lord places it upon us to go to that person in private and say, Hey, look, mate, when you did that, you stepped on my toe. All right? Now, if your brother or sister listens in that private place, then you've regained a brother and sister. Peter actually writes later, he quotes the Proverbs and says that love covers a multitude of wrongs. He writes that in 1 Peter 4.8. That love covers. And that's that place of love covering. It's not ignoring the wrong, but it's covering it from other eyes. You're keeping it private. It's just between you and me. Look, mate, you stepped on my toes. Can you just, you know, next time can you be careful? And of course, then we have an opportunity to repent. Those of us who have stepped on the toes, that's usually me. And we have an opportunity to repent and restore the relationship that we didn't even realize was on the verge of breaking. And there's an opportunity to demonstrate love to one another. That's the way it's supposed to happen. But if it doesn't happen, and you start butting heads, and he's like, no, I didn't step on your toes, that wasn't me. And you're like, pretty sure it was. Pretty sure it was your foot, your boot marks on my shoe, pretty sure. And like, no, it wasn't me. Then you take two or three. You know the whole concept of having a mediator in, in marital disputes, or a mediator in, you know, the, the world's kind of taken this up. Having a counselor going to a family counselor or a marriage counselor the whole point is you have an independent party to mediate who can say look mate it really is your boot mark on his shoe or he listens to the other side and says no nah, he wasn't there that might have been his twin brother just as an example and so there's this you know a mediation between the two the goal of all of it is restoration of relationship but if the mediators and you both agree that no, this individual is wrong. They really did step on your toe. And there's a refusal on the part of the other party to repent. Then it is a responsibility to bring it before the community. To bring it before, um, in our congregation, look, if somebody's offended you and you've gone to them in person, in public, or privately rather, and you've gone, tried to restore the relationship and it's not working, bring it to the leadership. We can act as mediators. And if there is a refusal to repent, then as a, as a community, we have to stand up and acknowledge this guy is stepping on people's toes on purpose without repentance. And then the whole purpose of that still is restoration. Please repent. 
before this community. Now, I've been in a situation. I We were visiting uh, in Nepal, and um, so we were just listening through translators, and the pastor was getting up. He was fired up, fired up. I had never seen Pastor Silas, he took on Silas's name, he was probably one of the greatest apostles that Nepal has ever seen. Um, and I don't know if he's still alive. He was in and out of jail and because of preaching the gospel. It's still illegal to preach the gospel in Nepal. Um, and, but he was, he was fired up. And he was telling the congregation that the visiting a missionary was out of the congregation because he refused to repent. The sin happened in, in that case. The sin was that the missionary wore white to a funeral. Now, that may not, not mean anything to you. That's fine. But in Hinduism, you wear white to a funeral, not just out of respect for the family, but out of respect to the gods. It is seen as an idolatrous thing from a Hindu perspective. The missionary only saw it as a cultural thing and refused to repent. And so the pastor could not make headways with the missionary. So publicly was this guy's refusing to repent. And this is why. This is what we've done. He's out. And um, that's a painful thing. And we're listening through a translator just shrinking into our seat saying, I haven't seen this <laughs> very often. But you know what? We have to understand that there are times when, when the sins of an individual are grievous to the point of being idolatrous. Those are especially grievous where there's no repentance and there's an idolatry or a, a false religion and we have to address it. If the other individual <coughs> refuses to listen, what are we supposed to do but say to the congregation, this person is no longer following the true gospel. Now that sounds a little bit closer to the discussion between Peter and Paul. So back to that Peter and Paul. You know, I don't think that Paul had read the gospel of Matthew. So Matthew chapter 18. Some chuckles for those of you who are in the know. The reality is, is Galatians is probably one of the first letters of the New Testament that was ever written. So yes, he had not writ read Matthew's account uh, hadn't been written. It's kind of hard to read something that hadn't been written. That being said, Paul recognized that this action of Peter was going to seriously change the direction of the good news. It was going to add something to the good news that Yeshua had not required of the Gentiles. And that is to become Jewish. There was such a passion and, and in Paul to see that the good news was kept open to all. That it was through a trusting faithfulness to Yeshua and because of the trusting faithfulness of Yeshua that we gained justification. That we were set right, made righteous, as it says right at the end of this passage. But Paul, even in that, approaches Peter in probably the most wise way of bringing correction to anybody's life, and that is to ask them questions. You can point out faults. You can say, hey, look, you did this. This is wrong. You shouldn't do this again. But if somebody does that to me, my automatic reaction, be it flesh or probably not spirit, but is to put up my defenses and say, no, 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 I'm not going to listen to that. But if somebody asks me a direct but leading question, just like Paul asks, I automatically engage, I think about it, and then I hopefully realize where I'm wrong. So Paul does exactly that. He asks this question. He says, if you, being a Jew, live like the Gentiles and not like the Jews, how can you force the Gentiles to live like Jews? Because Peter had obviously been eating with the Gentiles, something that the, the, uh, the Pharisees and the Sadducees would never have done and, and directly spoke against. But Paul asks this question and then uses that to go in and say, we who are Jews by birth and not sinners from among the Gentiles, we know that a person is set right, not by deeds based upon Torah, but rather by putting trust in Messiah Yeshua. Now, mine has a little footnote here in that there's two ways of reading that Greek sentence. It is by putting trust in Messiah Yeshua, or it is by the faithfulness 
of Messiah, Yeshua. So trust in versus the trust of. The faithfulness, faith in Yeshua versus the faithfulness of Yeshua. It can be read both ways. And a lot of the, the later translations will actually have both options in there. I know the complete Jewish Bible, uh, David Stern, specifically brings out that point. That our faithfulness, we, are, we become faithful and trust in Yeshua because He was faithful first. It is the faithfulness of Yeshua and His trust in Adonai that He was faithful unto death, even the death of the cross. We know that on the last night before He died, Yeshua prayed, Let this cup pass from me, but not my will, but yours be done. Not my will, but yours be done. Uh, Andre, if I could get you to turn the heater back on. I'm starting to feel a little bit of a chill <laughs> myself. I'm, uh, I have the coldest blood in my family. I don't know if that's a thing. So if I get cold, everybody's cold. Nobody else is cold, but they, all the kids are like, we're not cold. I'm like, I'm freezing. So I think it's a good thing. I keep the house toasty. But um, So... Coming back to this, a person, we know that a person is not set right, not justified, not set right, made righteous before God by following the deeds based upon Torah, rather by the faithfulness of Yeshua. You see, as, lo as much as we might long to follow the commandments of the Lord, as much as we might have a heart to, to strive, to go after the Lord, even with all that energy that we might put into it, we still fail. For all have sinned and fallen short of God's glory. Yet there was one man who was faithful to fulfill all of the covenant and all the commands. And that is Messiah Yeshua. And so we put our trust in in him because he is trustworthy we put our faith in him because he is faithful and we are called to remain faithful even to the point of death this this way of looking at this when i just read this i thought about it and i've thought about the different times where the lord has really touched me in my life where god's really ministered and it's been times when i when i've sat back and not even with a Bible in front of me, but just thinking and meditating on what Yeshua did for me. And the realization of, you know, the death on the cross, He did not deserve that. I deserve that. And just that understanding, I say, wow, look at the love through the faithfulness of Yeshua. And it just brings me to a place of tears and I just get overwhelmed again and thankful again at the salvation that the Lord has provided because He was faithful. And because He was faithful, He can empower us to be faithful. It's not the other way around. We trust in His faithfulness and He gives us a new heart and, and causes us to, to have His Spirit residing in us, to give us the power, to be empowered, that dunamis, the power of the Holy Spirit. We are empowered to follow the Lord and to be faithful to the Lord unto the point of death. We see Yeshua specifically talking of this in Revelation when He's writing to the churches. He specifically says, Be faithful to Me even to the point of death. There's this call of faithfulness. And I think... In our Western view, we sometimes think of belief. You know, I believe in Jesus. I believe that Jesus existed. We say, I believe this. Um, there's a difference between believing that and believing in. And it's this trust and the faithfulness. Having a faith that goes beyond just today. We are faithful every single day. Paul now goes into uh, a couple of different discussions. Let me flip over. So verse 17. So verse 17, Paul now uses this, uh, this story with Peter 
Uh, there's several dis different uh, ideas as to when the conversation with <coughs> Peter ends and when the discussion with the Galatians begins. Uh, a lot of your translations will probably have verse 16 in quotes. I know that uh, David Stern puts all the way up, uh, by, by, let me rephrase that, they have verse, um, oh, the end of verse 14 in quotes rather, and then David Stern puts all the way up to verse 16 in quotes. So the, the question is, to, it's not, it doesn't really matter, it's just a discussion as to which parts are part of the original discussion and which part is now what Paul is trying to get across to the Galatians. But in verse 17, there's a specific change in the tone, uh, a change that goes from specific directive, sort of confrontational uh, verbiage, just the, the way the verbs are structured, to a point of teaching and instructing, more of a gentle tone. It says, but if, while seeking to be justified in Messiah, we ourselves are found to be sinners, is Messiah an agent of sin? That's an interesting discussion. We don't usually hear it maybe in those terms, but how many have uh, heard people say, well, if, if Jesus is really God, or if you know God really exists, the Judeo-Christian God really exists, then why are so many Christians so hypocritical or so sinful? Has anybody heard that argument? That's what this argument is, right? It's saying, well, look, if we still sin, does that mean, and Yeshua is uh, the savior of sinners, then does that mean Yeshua supports the sin? You see, that's the same argument. I, I've heard it a lot in some of the debates where, where people will say, well, there's so much evil in the world. There's evil everywhere we look. You know, people perpetrating evil. There's natural disasters and all these sorts of things. Well, if the world is so full of evil, then how can a good God exist? And really, it's part of that same churning. If I see evil, if I see people perpetrating evil, if I see Christians be claiming to be followers of God, and I know from an atheistic perspective, they will include all religions usually in that, so works done in the name of Allah, so in Islam, they'll lump it all together and they say, if I see all these evil things perpetrated by Christians, then does that mean that God supports, the God that you serve supports all this evil? Of course, Paul's response to that is the strongest, uh, absolutely not. I like, hell no. Or uh, in, I think in this, in this translation it says, may it never be. Uh, Never, absolutely not. That is completely the wrong conclusion. Just because there is still sin, that we may, that we may do a sin, God has already changed our nature. It is no longer our natural for us to sin. That is the change of the nature. But we may continue some of those old habits, those old structures of thinking, the, the, the lies that we tell ourselves. We may continue some of those things beyond the point of accepting Yeshua and being born again. But it does not mean that Yeshua supports the sin that still shows up in our life every once in a while. However, he, this is obviously something that the, the people of the circumcision were trying to say, is that you're preaching a gospel of license. You're saying that God's grace is greasy. Greasy grace, if you've heard the... You know, you're saying that well, you know what, we might as well sin so that God's grace might abound. That sounds familiar because Paul says that to the Romans, right? And his response is the same in that situation. May it never be. This is not the purpose. This is, this is not the right conclusion. And so we see that the, he is absolutely saying, this is the farthest from my conclusions. This is not what I'm preaching. This is not part of the good news. It also doesn't logically follow. It may be a conclusion, but it is not guaranteed to be the conclusion. Just because we see evil perpetrated by people, Yeshua is very clear. He says many will come in the end and say, But Lord, Lord, we did miracles in your name. We cast out demons in your name. And he, Yeshua says, And I will turn to them and say, Depart from me, you never knew me. And I... I I think about that. 
people working and moving in the power of the Holy Spirit and yet not knowing Yeshua and Yeshua not knowing them. You know, in, in the end, it's not good enough for just us to know Yeshua. Yeshua needs to know us. That's that two parts of the relationship. When we invite Yeshua into our lives, we tell this to our children. It's a simple, simple we say, Yeshua, please come into my heart. And kids kind of, they, they see it in a certain way. But there is an absolute truth in that. What we are saying is, Yeshua, I am inviting you to look at all those areas in my life that are in that dusty closet. I am inviting you to know me. You know the things that you might only share with one or two other people? Those secrets that are, that are painful maybe. Things that have been done to you or that you have done. Those things that are there that you may only share with somebody as close as your spouse. Yeshua says, will you let me in? I stand at the door and knock. Anyone who hears my voice and opens, I will come in and sup. I will fellowship with that one. And this is exactly what is supposed to happen. We are inviting Yeshua in. And to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So just because there may be areas and dusty closets that the Lord has not yet addressed in our life, doesn't mean that He condones those actions in us or in others. And just because there's evil in the world, does not mean that a good God does not exist. It's quite the contrary. The only reason we know what is evil is because we know what is good. And the only way that we know what is good and evil is because there is a lawgiver who is good and has defined what is good based upon his own character. Everything that is in line with God's character is good and holy and right. The next argument that, that Paul goes on to in verse 18, he says, If I rebuild the very things I tore down, I prove that I myself am a lawbreaker. So we just talked about using the gospel for license. Now there's this place of going back into legalism, saying, oh, I've got to do all these things for God to justify me, for God to even accept me, for God to even come into my heart. I have to do all these things. And that is not the point. Because if we try and go back into that place, the law will do what the law does. It proves that we are sinners. It proves that we don't measure up. It proves that we fail. I guarantee if you go and start reading through the scriptures, even people who say, look, I follow all the laws. You sit back and say, well, there's no temple. All the laws? There's a whole bunch of laws we can't even follow. There's a bunch of laws that are only apply to, to priests. And under the Mosaic Covenant, we only had access to repentance and forgiveness through the sacrifice of an animal. But we know that we have a greater sacrifice in Messiah Yeshua. So therefore, we come under the new covenant spoken of in Jeremiah 33. But if we go back under that place, we simply prove that we are sinners. And if we therefore leave our trust in Messiah, we, we say, well, I'm no longer being justified because of the, the faith in Messiah, the trust in Messiah. And you go back to try and be justified under the law by keeping all of the Torah. We only prove that we fall short. Saul speaks of this openly in, in Romans chapter 7. You want to read Romans 7? He's talking about, you know, I do the things that I don't want to do. And I don't do the things that I do want to do. O oh, wretched man that I am, who will save me from this body of death? I thank you. Thanks be to God. Through Yeshua the Messiah. Therefore, I will serve Him. And so, read that passage because there's that hope. It's like, yeah, you can go back and try and follow the Scripture. And I, in, in Messianic Judaism, we've uh, met up with a lot of people who who start following Yeshua and then try and either go back into Rabbinic Judaism, trying to follow all of the Torah, and then start leaving and walking away from Yeshua. It's, an, it's a natural progression. Because there's a seeking to be justified by Torah and a seeking to be justified by the faithfulness of Yeshua. And the two don't mix. And I've watched many, of many, many of my friends who 
who will either, if they're, if they're Jewish, they'll go back into uh, to Orthodox Judaism, completely rejecting Yeshua. They might say, well, he might be the Messiah. They, they go to oh, completely leave him. They'll say, he, well, he's no longer fully God and fully man. Maybe he was just a man. And maybe just a good teacher. And they walk away from Messiah. Because the two, you can't get justification by both ways. We have to acknowledge that our justification, our being right, set right, uh, forensically set right is the, the, I guess, the technical term. To be made right, that being born again that Yeshua speaks of in John chapter 3. We have to understand that if our justification comes through our faith in Yeshua, it doesn't come because we are perfectly following the Torah of God. The good life that we now live, we no longer, it is no longer us who lives. It is Messiah who lives in us. We have been crucified with Messiah. When we come into that covenantal relationship with Messiah, a covenant is different than a contract. A covenant basically says everything that is yours is mine and everything that is mine is yours. It is a one plus one equals one relationship. That's the relationship we see that is supposed to happen in marriage and it's the relationship we see with Yeshua. And what it means is because Yeshua died, he died on our behalf. We are the bride of Messiah. We talk of that. Therefore, we're in covenantal relationship. It is as if I died because I'm in covenant with Yeshua. Therefore, the righteousness of Yeshua and the resurrection life of Yeshua, therefore that is also mine. The righteousness that He attained is my righteousness. I will be set right and justified because I will plead before the court of God in heaven the blood of Yeshua Messiah and saying, I'm in covenant with Him. When you see me, you see him. We're in relationship. That is the good news. And that comes very, very simply. The application is very simple. It is the simple good news. We must trust in Yeshua. We must ask to be united with him in his death so that we might be united with him in his resurrection life. And we must continue to live day to day by the same trusting faithfulness that Yeshua, the Son of God, had. Amen? Amen. Amen? Amen. Father, we just thank you that it is that simple. That we are set right before you because of the faithfulness of Yeshua. And therefore, we trust in what he did on that cross in our place. And we apply that to our lives. We apply the blood of Yeshua over our lives. Just as the blood of a sacrificed animal would cover the sins of the people, so also the blood of Messiah Yeshua covers our sins. It pays for us. It pays the wages that we should have paid. And therefore we can partake in the righteousness of Messiah, in the freedom of Messiah, in the joy of following after you with all of our heart, our soul, and our mind. It can be a joy to love, to run after you, to do what pleases you, but from a place of acceptance, a place of being adopted children in your family. Thank you for that. In Yeshua's precious name. Amen. Amen.